Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Jennifer LaRue. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm delighted to be hosting this evening's program with Richard Thompson Ford and Corey Seymour. We've just spent a, about uh, 15 minutes or so chatting in the green room and so many interesting things came up that I know will come up in the conversation. And I will just tell you, you're in for a treat and it's going to be very thought provoking. Um, I'm not going to talk for too long because I know you, I'm not who you came to hear speak, but I do want to just do a little bit of housekeeping if I might. Um, first of all, uh, please hop in the chat there. Um, I've, I've posted a couple things that I'll tell you about in just a moment, but the chat is part of the fun of the virtual programming world. And so get in there, please, and let us know where you're from and, uh, you know, that, chat. However, if you have a question anytime during the program that you'd like to pose during the Q&A section, of the, the program, um, please put that in the ask a question area rather than the chat. I'll be popping back on screen to help manage the Q&A and uh, you'll make my life so much easier if you can just put your question and ask a question rather than have me have to search for it in the chat. So thank you in advance for that. While we're taking a look down there at the bottom of the screen where it says ask a question, if you just glance up a line above where it says your support is vital to the Mark Twain House and Museum, please donate here. Um, we ex are very grateful for any anything you can share with us in the way of a donation, be it five dollars, fifty dollars, anything. Um, we were really proud of uh, how we've persevered as an institution through COVID, um, but it has not been easy, and we're not quite out of the woods just yet. So uh, anything you can do to support us, and by uh, clicking there, you're also supporting our virtual programs. But, uh, which we've uh, been offering sometimes three or four a week uh, during uh, the pandemic. And we're really proud of that work uh, and we appreciate any support you can offer. So thank you. Speaking of support, tonight we're going to be talking about Richard Thompson Ford's book, Dress Codes, How the Laws of Fashion Made History. And you can order this book. We know you can get it elsewhere, but please know that if you do, Click the link that's at the top of the chat there uh, and order your copy. You get a signed copy, first of all, and you have the um, benefit of knowing that your purchase does support the Mark Twain House and Museum. And again, we appreciate that very much. I want to thank our sponsors tonight. Our sponsors are, uh, all of our, our virtual programs are sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation and by Connecticut Public WNPR. This, like all of our programs, also is produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord, who was one of our beloved trustees uh, who recently passed away. So we're very um, grateful to be able to honor his legacy in this way. And before I turn things over and introduce our guests, I do want to invite you to join us on November 4th for our annual virtual gala, um, Mark Twain Around the World. We've got a whole bunch of wonderful writer friends lined up um, to appear uh, and speak to you. Nelson DeMille, Jill Sabule, Kevin Kwan, David Baldacci, Azar Nafisi, and so many more. I've put a link in the chat for that as well, so please check it out and please plan to join us. It's a wide array of awesome auction items um, that you can uh, enjoy and, and, and bid for and see what happens. So has, having said all that, I'd like to introduce Corey Seymour, he's senior editor at Vogue and the author with Jan Wenner of Gonzo, The Life of Hunter S. Thompson. He's going to be in conversation tonight with the author of tonight's book, Richard Thompson Ford, who's the George E. Osborne Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. He's an expert on civil rights and anti-discrimination law. He's distinguished himself as an insightful voice and compelling writer on questions of race and multiculturalism. His scholarship combines social criticism and legal analysis, and he writes for both popular readers and for academic and legal specialists. He's written for the Washington Post, San Francisco Chronicle, Christian Science Monitor, and for Slate, where he's a regular contributor. And his most recent books, other than the very most recent one, include Rights Gone Wrong, How Law Corrupts the Struggle for Equality, which the New York Times Sunday Book Review selected as one of the 100 notable books of 2011, and in 2012, On Being a Black Lawyer, selected him, excuse me, selected him as one of the most 100 inf most influential black lawyers in the nation. So I'm going to bring them both on screen, and everybody, please join me in welcoming Richard Ford Thompson, and Corey Seymour. Give me just a sec. Hi. Welcome, Hi Corey and Richard. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks Thank for you having for us. 
Corey, will you let me know when it's time for me to pop back on screen and help with the Q&A? Absolutely. Thank you, Jennifer. No, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to sit back and enjoy with everybody else. So we'll see you in a little bit then. Very good. Thank you, everybody, for, for being here and for joining us tonight. And thank you, Richard, uh, for joining us. And thank you for writing this amazing book, which I spent a lot of time in the last few weeks devouring. Um, I've got a few questions, but uh, if, if, if there's anything I'm missing, if you want to jump in, please butt in, because we want to hear more from you than from me, I think so. Uh, well, the first so thing. Much. Oh, yeah. Thank you for much, so much for um, coming to talk to me. And thanks, everyone, for um, coming to see us as well. First thing I'd like to know is something I ask a lot of people that I chat with, which is kind of like, why? How? Like, what is the original? What led you to do this? We've just heard that very august introduction uh, from Jennifer uh, listing just a few of these very amazing accomplishments of yours. What then told you? the Stanford law professor and esteemed author and thinker, why did you want to write a book about dress codes? And I, I, would, I will say to any of you out there who haven't read the book yet, that once you do read the book, once you get into it a little bit, I think it makes a lot more sense that we have this legal scholar uh, writing this book. But I want to hear from you, Richard, what was the original spark? And did anybody think you were crazy or a little weird? Why are you writing this book about dress or dress codes? or fashion. Well, yes, well, in answer to the second question, yes, there were people who said, a book about what? Uh, you know, how exactly does this relate to anything that we do at a law school? And it took me a little while to explain it to them, but there are two reasons that I decided to write the book. Uh, one's personal, one's professional. So the, um, the professional reason is that there are a lot of legal disputes that involve dress codes. There are a lot of disputes in employment discrimination, which is one of the classes that I teach, uh, where people will sue their employer for dress codes that they consider to be um, racist or sexist, dress codes that prohibit um, the hair styles that, that many African Americans, particularly the African American women, wear, um, dress codes that require women and only women to wear makeup or to tease their hair or to wear high heeled shoes, or dress codes that forbid certain types of clothing that are important to religious um, traditions, like head coverings. So there's that set. Um, and even in the high school and public school context, there's some litigation around dress codes as um, either, again, discriminatory or um, restrictions on freedom of expression. So, you know, it's interesting in all these cases, but the thing is, the courts never seem to get it right in my view, even if I like the outcome. You know, sometimes I didn't like the outcome. Sometimes I agreed with the outcome, but I thought the analysis was almost always kind of weak. And one of the reasons it's weak is because the law didn't give a good way of talking about why clothing is important to people. Instead, it had to tie it to something else. And often the courts even said, well, obviously clothing is trivial. Um, and would not, you know, beneath the attention of the courts. However, this in this particular case, perhaps um, it merits our attention because it's tied to something else like race discrimination um, or, or sex discrimination. And I thought well, that was not true and didn't often get at what the people in the cases cared about. And so sometimes the courts would deny a plaintiff relief when they really deserved relief, in my view, because the courts thought, well, fashion's trivial. So that's the professional reason. Personal reason is, you know, growing up, my father, um, uh, I was a snappy dresser and he did it because he enjoyed it. And um, he actually trained as a tailor. And so he cared a lot about the way clothing was constructed and he had a sense for um, style. But there was a more profound um, reason as well, which is he, as an African-American, he was often one of the first in uh, African-Americans in a lot of the places where he worked. And um, uh, dress was a way for him to really assert professional status and personal dignity. And I could see that growing up. So I saw right away that there was a lot more to his personal style than just um, you know, making what, you know, the stereotypical fashion statement. And so those two things made me want to talk more about why clothing might be important and why we regulate it so much. We have so many rules and expectations about it. I think something I think that comes that comes, that comes to you really clearly, clearly is uh, this notion that 
of, of the power of clothes and, and what, you're right, that in, especially in the legal sense, uh, these cases were often dismissed for being, oh, you know, they just want her to change her hairstyle. It's, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Uh, or they want her to wear a, a slightly longer skirt. You know, what's wrong with that? And I think that something that this book makes abundantly clear is the immense power of clothes. They are, and they are, can be gateways to somewhere. And there's uh, often, there's a, a powerful entity that wants to, they want to watch that gate. And that's what your book is kind of all about. Um, I, there's also, I, I like the personal interest uh, that you brought into this book with your dad. Uh, there's also something you bring this to yourself. I'm sure it's maybe because of your dad a bit, but uh, you were, you entered in 2009 Esquire Magazine's Best Dressed Real Man Contest. Tell yes. me how you heard about it why you wanted to join it or join the battle and what happened? Well, I'd read the magazine for a while and, you know, every year I'd see this best dressed real man contest, but the year I decided to join it, we, uh, um, we just had our second child. And so she's was um, a few months old. And of course, the, you know, thinking about being, you know, fashionable or chic is the last thing on your mind when you've got a, a new infant in the house. So, you know, we were getting two hours of sleep a night and, and um, I thought, well, what better time to try this new um, thing? And it'll be fun. And, you know, my friends will get a kick out of it because they'll go, you know, here he is with a, you know, a baby and barely getting any sleep, but he's going to be the best dressed real man. So, um, so I, I entered and, um, you know, I got a lot further than I thought I would. It was a lot of fun. I did wind up blowing the interview. Uh, I was asked a series of questions by an editor from Esquire. So you can see I'm going to be intimidated by an editor from a fashion magazine because the, the last time I spoke to one, I blew the interview. Um, you know, I couldn't for the life of me answer the kinds of questions they were asking about, you know, what is your personal style? Why do you dress the way you do? What does it communicate? And, you know, I, I, my job is to explain things to people for a living couldn't do it to save my life. So I thought it's time for me to hit the library and come up with a better answer to these questions. It's very funny because you're almost too real for the real man contest, right? I mean, like <laughs> you, you didn't have a good line about it, maybe. Um, I, I, I will admit, you know, I think we all approach books or, you know, people, jobs, whatever. We walk into things with preconceptions. And when I first skimmed, you know, we probably looked at the cover of your book and it's about the laws of fashion. It's about dress codes. I somehow thought that it was maybe going to focus a lot on what to me maybe seemed like a golden age of dress codes, which I consider to be the 20th century. Uh, I think of dress codes, I think of the 21 club where you had to wear a, a jacket and tie. If you didn't have one, they'd give you one to wear. Uh, I think of certain snooty private country clubs and things that you, you had to look a certain way, have a certain kind of collar, all, you know, places, uh, tennis clubs where you have to wear all white. They all seem to me to be this very, I don't know, Sinatra era kind of thing yeah. where the way you tied your tie actually meant something. Um, and it seems that maybe we're over that now. Uh, and I was amazed, of course, within a, a page or something of your book. Obviously, dress codes started a long time ago. They started in a much more serious realm. We're talking about Joan of Arc, who had the nerve to wear clothes that fit her body because they had to fit underneath armor. It was a functional outfit that she wore, which she then wore without armor and, you know, bad things happened to her. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that the Catholic Church and other powerful institutions needed to regulate. Uh, royalty had to regulate because if you wore a certain kind of velvet, you were maybe trying to pass yourself off as being royalty. And, you know, you could probably get very real things from doing that as opposed to now. Nobody would care if you wanted to wear a crown or you could do what Rihanna did at the Met Ball and you could wear the, a, a, a meter like the Pope and nothing happens to you other than you're in you're on the front page of every sort of like, you know, fashion magazine around the world or fashion website. <laughs> uh, I think we also think, you know, now the 21 Club either doesn't, maybe they went under, maybe they're going to still 
get out of bankruptcy or whatever the problem was. But in any case, the notion of the jacket and tie at the 21 Club seems to be long past us. Dress codes are not a thing. You can wear sweatpants on airplanes. And then I read your book and discover that actually in schools now, there are more dress codes in schools now than there were 20 years ago. So dress codes have always been with us. Dress codes will always, do you think they will always be with us? What's changed about dress codes now and why are we not, are we not in the golden age of dress codes anymore? Yes. Well, I think some form of dress code will probably always be with us, even if it's not written. So the in the 20th century, especially the late 20th century and now the 21st, um, you start to get a bit fewer written dress codes, except in high schools and, and grade schools where you still see them. But um, there are a lot of unwritten expectations and norms around dress. You know, I mean, I'm in the Silicon Valley um, and you know, it's ground zero for people saying fashion doesn't matter, wear whatever you want, we're really relaxed about it. But it turns out in particular jobs, everyone's wearing the same thing. And if they're not, they get criticism for it. When you look at, you know, Marissa Mayer was on the, uh, in Vogue magazine, I believe with a, you know, a fashion, yeah. fashionable outfit. And, you know, people said, she looks like she's on vacation while everyone else is working. So suddenly her clothing became, you know, a, a symbol of the work ethic. And I think that's still very true that the, um, or, or Peter Thiel, the um, entrepreneur said, never invest in a tech company where the CEO wears a suit. So, you know, we've gone from, you have to wear a suit to you better not wear a suit um, or people won't take you seriously. That's a new kind of dress code. Uh, and, and I you know, will say also, if, if I can interrupt briefly that, uh, you know, I have, we have some friends in the, financial industry. And we actually have, I'm, I'm in the office of Vogue right now, which is in the World Trade Center in downtown Manhattan, right across the street is Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those guys do not, you know, these used to be the kind of Tom Wolf bonfire, the vanities, masters of the universe types that would wear really high end suits in the kind of American psycho look, if you will. Right. And, you know, they don't do that anymore now. But uh, what they do wear is a uniform as you get into very nicely later on in your book. Um, that is in many ways more rigid than if they wore suits. It's more rigid and probably less expressive than if they wore suits. They all wear, you can tell us what they wear. Yeah, at the Midtown uniform, there's an Instagram page with um, all these guys wearing the same thing, a Patagonia fleece and a button down collar shirt um, and a pair of khakis with some you know low kind of casual loafers. But it's remarkable how uniform it is, that they're all wearing exactly that. It seems like there are only two or three brands of fleece that are acceptable. It's either Patagonia or Vineyard Vines or maybe one other one. And um, the shirts are all the same, you know, exactly the same. So they went from no dress code right to a new dress code uh, in, you know, in a matter of, it seems like weeks. Honestly, like, so I saw the Midtown Uniform Instagram page, which is very much, very worth checking out. And I probably would have thought that it was a parody, but for the fact that I see these guys, we, we go to the same food court every day and I see them walking in groups of three or five and they all look absolutely identical. And you also point out in your book that there are very real, very detailed dress codes for, uh, or there are now, or there were 10 years ago for Starbucks baristas. Um, there are rules about how many shades away from their natural hair color they can dye their hair, whether or not they can have long fingernails, fingernail ornaments, things like that. Disney employees um, are not allowed, they have, need to have a certain kind of hairstyle, certain kind of clothing. Ritz Carlson employees, uh, famous actors and actresses, or in, in this case, female actors or actresses at the Cannes Film Festival uh, threw a fit a few years ago because they were required to wear high heels. Yes. Some of them said, that's not what we want to do. And it doesn't matter what they wanted to do. They had a dress code at the Cannes Film Festival. Yes. Yes, there are all sorts of dress codes. In the hospitality industry, they're everywhere. And some of them are remarkable because they don't just regulate the things you would expect, like um, you know, trying to promote a conservative image or something like that. But for a while back, Abercrombie and Fitch, um, for instance, they had a dress code that regulated things like how you could have your shirt untucked. So you could have your shirt untucked, but it had to be the Abercrombie way. And they had a book with a, a guide about how you could do it or how you could pop the collar of your shirt. So, you know, it's supposed to look casual, but in fact, it's quite scripted. Um, so, yeah, you get that. 
And then the, the things around women's attire in particular and the kinds of expectations that follow women are you know, can be quite pronounced. So the high-heeled shoes are just one example where so many workplaces require high-heeled shoes and there have been social protests against it all over the world. I also want to uh, just raise a kind of a general point that I think it's very easy for maybe people hearing this so far for hearing us talk about dress codes, they all seem so far largely like something that we want to get away from because they are, they're limiting us, they're inhibiting us, and they're, they're making us, they want round pegs going into round holes. And sometimes we're a square peg and we want, don't want to go into that round hole. And we think that the dress code is, is getting in our way and it's part of the world keeping us down or something. Mm -hmm. And I just would like I, mean, I certainly will, I'll cop to this myself. And I think it's worth thinking about as we read the book and as we think about dress codes that um, I think we've all got a certain kind of, whether it's a curmudgeon or it's something in us. You know, I, I walk my children to school and I'm amazed that children now can wear shorts <laughs> wherever, like they, to school. And I think we've all been somewhere when you want to you know, go out with a friend with a husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, partner somewhere to a really nice place. And there's somebody else in this very nice place and they look horrible. And you think, how did those people get in? Like, I, yeah. I think that it's, it's very easy to point fingers about dress codes. And I think it's also worth noting something that you do note later in your book that in many ways, there's a value in dress codes. Um, they can help social cohesion sometimes in schools if you have a dress code in school, that means that maybe some of the super rich kids or the aspirational kids who want to show off their amazing designer clothes every day and make other kids feel, whether they mean to or not, maybe that makes other children feel lesser. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe having a dress code there is not such a bad thing. Is there a, is there a positive side to dress codes? Oh, yes, I think there is, it, you know, because the, the key point is that because fashion and clothing matter, um, it matters when someone has a dress code and it can be done for good reasons or bad reasons and for good effect or bad effect. I, I think the examples that you give are great. I, you know, if I go to a really nice restaurant for a special occasion, it's, uh, a, it's a bummer if someone shows up in sweats or what, what, and, and that happens all the time where I live. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't think that's a matter of indifference and I don't think it's something where it's, um, you know, it, it brings down the experience. We care about all the aspects of the experience. And it should, you know, dress can show a certain type of respect for an important occasion um, or for a gathering. It, it can bring social cohesion. I, I, I write in the book about the civil rights movement in the, um, in the 1950s and 1960s, where effectively there was a dress code and people were you know, they were marching for social justice. They were sitting in at lunch counters where they knew they'd be attacked and they'd have, um, you know, racist mobs throw things at them. Uh, and they're wearing their Sunday best. And that was a statement. And it was a statement of personal pride. It was a statement of dignity. And it was an assertion of dignity that I think everyone in the civil rights movement understood, but also people from the outside understood as threatening to some extent, that to see this group of African-Americans dressed in this dignified manner, um, you, you know, insisting on their dignity was a threat. And it was an important part of the symbolism of the movement. So that kind of dress code was quite important, I think, even though, and, and you know, even later movements, for instance, that like the Black Panthers, that were in many ways, you know, movements that reacted, um, you know, against some of the things in the civil rights movement, you know, they wanted, they had a different approach to racial justice. They had a dress code too. You know, you, you look at them, obviously they cared about what they looked like. The Black Panthers had a minister of culture. Uh, they were thinking about this and they wrote about it and they talked about it. So that in a sense, that's a dress code and it's a dress code that's done for, um, you know, for, for understandable and, and positive reasons. Exactly. I want to ask you about some of the, there's a couple of very key terms that you, I, I don't think you're inventing these terms, you're, but you raise these terms in your book and they're very key to understanding a lot of what happens in your book and a lot of what's going on with uh, dress codes. And the first maybe major one of those 
is something called, I think, especially understanding the origin of dress codes, is something called sumptuary laws. Yes. If you could explain what sumptuary laws are and where they come from, because to me, that's the beating heart of, of dress codes. Yes. For the well, origin. So sumptuary laws uh, really got going in the 1300s. There were some earlier, but in the 1300s, they really started to expand. There were laws that regulated primarily clothing, although sometimes they also regulated things like um, um, social gatherings. And um, but but we'll focus on the clothing. And they would sometimes be quite specific about who was entitled to wear what. So, you know, only the, a knight of the garter or above in rank will be entitled to wear crimson silk or velvet or ermine fur. And um, in some cases, these laws were um, passed several a year. So during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, for instance, um, you had multiple what were called acts of apparel that were passed in, you know, uh, often many in a single year with all sorts of regulations down to the you know lowest commoner about what they could wear regulating you know how much cloth could be used in clothing and um a lot of this as you said before was to ensure that you understood who someone was by what they were wearing what their social rank was um so the elite were using clothing really as a political manifesto to some extent. Queen Elizabeth is a great example of that and wanted to make sure that because she's communicating her magnificence and her right to rule through her magnificent attire, it, it won't do if the butcher's wife is also wearing similar clothing. So you needed regulations. And that's the, um, the origin of sumptuary laws. And they were all over, um, certainly all over uh, Europe. And I think and it's I fascinating, think it's fascinating to, kind of to kind of know that, that uh, while, uh, we're while we're talking about the 1800s, 1400s, 1400s. 1400s. Uh, uh, I think anybody here knows what a sumptuary law is. If you've ever been in a business meeting with someone or you've, you're in an office environment or a work environment and everyone's sitting around the table and you have someone who maybe has the same job that you have or maybe they're one rung lower. And if he's a man, maybe he's wearing French puffs or something. Maybe he's got a <laughs> double-breasted suit on. And it's a, it, I think a lot of dress codes in a very vernacular way are essentially about the question of like, how dare you? Mm -hmm. How dare you wear that? How dare you dress above your station? Yes. And it's also worth noting that you, something you bring out nicely in the book is there were sumptuary laws about uh, for prostitutes in 15th century Italy. Um, they were some of them were prevented from wearing fur velvet certain things like that in other regions they were required to wear that to identify themselves to others as prostitutes they were just a way of broadcasting something yes yes that relationship between uh you know sumptuous attire and display and um sexual conduct or um, you know, status, it was very striking and, and quite complex. So in some cases, as you say, uh, the idea was we don't want the prostitutes to be too attractive. And so we're gonna forbid them from using kind of the tools of their trade to entice men. Um, and in other cases, it was that type of clothing, vanities are the mark of a sinful woman. A decent woman wouldn't dress that way. And so we're going to require the prostitute to wear it so everyone will know she's not a decent woman. And, um, you know, this was at a time when the church, for instance, was um, admonishing believers not to indulge in vanities. And there were lots of speeches and sermons directed at um, women not wearing cosmetics, not wearing jewelry, not indulging in these kinds of things, um, but will require the prostitutes to do it. So that, you know, that that relationship is something that, you know, I think in some ways is still with us to this day. The idea that you would know uh, about a woman's virtue, you know, and it's particular to, to women, a woman's virtue, according to what she what type of clothing she's wearing. Absolutely. Uh, something else I found fascinating in the way that it's relevant today is you bring up the notion that around the 16th century is maybe arguably the around the time when the notion of fashion itself was invented as a concept. 
uh, and maybe before then, clothes were just clothes. They're what you wore. And again, they largely probably distinguished you. They, they had certain signifiers to them. You wear a certain kind of clothing. He's a blacksmith. He's a bishop. She's a housewife. You know, like we can identify these things by clothing. Around the 16th century, if we say fashion is invented, then what does that mean? I think it means that, that what you wear then becomes a method of you expressing yourself. You're expressing something about who you are, your personality, your individuality, um, which is something I found fascinating because over the last, I've been working at Vogue for about a decade. Um, sometime during this past decade, I think our notion of what we understand of fashion has changed in this very similar way. And obviously fashion, it changes all the time. Um, maybe it's more the notion of what a fashion magazine is expected to do, to do for its reader. And I think they have, a, fashion magazines have a long history of telling the reader, obviously different magazines do things in different ways, but broadly, I think they, they tell the reader, this is the new trend. This mm -hmm. is the way fashion is going right now. Hemlines are up. Um, people are wearing more dresses like this, uh, patterns like this. And over the last 10 years in a very real way and seemingly for a long time, I mean, going forward, fashion, what we are doing for our reader is not that. We are helping our reader to express their individuality and their mm -hmm. authenticity. No one really wants to talk about, this is what you need to do now. This is the trend. This is the hot thing that is the, the thing now. It's not really about that anymore. It's about whatever you want it to be, which is essentially the definition of fashion. Is that correct? Yes, I love that. Yes. So, we, and so you have this transition from the fashion expressing social status. And of course, it still does that. That never goes away. But at the same time, fashion begins to become a statement of individuality. And I believe that the development of fashion is tightly bound to the development of ideas about individuality, um, you know, ideas that in, the individual is primary, the ideas about individual psychology, and ultimately even political ideals about the importance of individual liberty and individual rights. So you begin to get this idea and it's expressed through clothing and people can then, you know, really kind of wear that on their bodies. I'm a distinctive person and you know, look at me and what I'm wearing. And some of what was going on with the sanctuary laws really was an attack on that as well, because that was also threatening to a social order that was organized around social rank and position. And um, and in those kinds of roles as being um, almost immutable and passed down from generation to generation, and then in opposition to that, you have the idea of the individual uh, as you know expressed in each person. Now, I and I think it's certainly interesting that in today's environment, the idea of authenticity has become so powerful that it's uh, 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 you know the overwhelming norm is that people should express their authenticity through what they wear, through the things that surround them in all respects. And that's a new, I mean, I do think that that's accelerated in recent years. So I'm really interested to hear that you, even during your 10 years at Vogue, that's become more the norm because it fits in perfectly with what I have observed in my research too. For sure. Yeah. And it, it, no doubt social media has a lot to do with that. Everyone Mm -hmm. You can live in a world where the news that you get is curated, whether you like it or not. It's right. being fed to you and you only based on your past preferences. And so we all become the masters of our own domain, for better or worse, um, at the expense of a kind of group cohesion. And so, like, of course, it is a very threatening thing if you go back to the 16th century, 17th century, when all of these institutions that could easily say, well, that's my congregation. That's my group of workers over there. They all look the same. They all do the same thing. And it, when everyone starts saying, no, I am I'm my own person. I'm gonna express that in the way I dress. It, of course, it goes without saying that would then probably change the way you act, the way you think about yourself. Maybe you don't need that group anymore. I don't know. It's just, it's a Pandora, right? Right, right. I can form a new social group. So suddenly, right. 
um, merchants and skilled tradespeople become their own group with significance, you know, the bourgeoisie, rather than there's the nobility and then everybody else, you know, now yeah. wealth tradespeople are also important, you know, uh oh, that's, that's a threat to the old social order. Some, there's a other great big term that I think is central to the book. Uh, if you could explain to us, please, uh, what is the, the great masculine renunciation? I just yes. I love the phrase. It's something that seemed to happen in maybe as little as three decades in the, the late 18th century that I think you can tell us, I, I think it maybe changed the way men dress forever since then. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. So that term was coined by actually a, a dress reform advocate named um, John Carl Flugel, but he's talking about the 18th century. Uh, um, and it's um, so before the great masculine renunciation, elite men expressed their status through opulence and display. It's all the things we were talking about before. So, it, and, and a lot of the greatest advances and the most fashion forward things um, were, were for men. Uh, and, and a lot of the most flamboyant fashions were worn by men because men were the, you know, at the top of the social hierarchy. We're um, talking like Louis, Louis the 14th kind of thing. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, Louis the 14th is a perfect example of it. But of course, it's all over Europe. You know, Charles the first was doing exactly the same thing. It's, you know, red shoes and, and big powdered wigs, all of this. And so this has been true for hundreds of years since the time of Henry the eighth forward. Um, you get to the uh, the the 1700s, and new ideals are beginning to emerge. There's an ideal of, um, to some extent, egalitarianism. There's an ideal of industriousness. There's an ideal of rationality. The Enlightenment um, is happening, and that's in different places at, at different times in different places. But in this period of time, in the late 1800s, men begin to dress down. They dress in sober clothing. They dress in um, understated clothing, darker colors. So by the time you get to Bro Bum Bo Brummel, um, you know, that paragon of masculine vanity, he was known for dressing in an understated fashion. He, he was actually famous for dressing in such a way that no one would be able to copy him because there was nothing to copy. That's what one of his admirers once said. So this new move away was expressing all of these new um, ideals and it did happen very quickly. So um, you know, maybe 30, 40 years and men go from the Louis XIV look to the Beau Brummel look, which may look dressed up to us today, but at the time was very sober and was kind of the precursor to the three piece suit or the business suit and even the jackets that we're both wearing. And I think something that is amazing about that is just, yes, that it suddenly went from an opulent thing to this very spare, let's say aesthetic kind of thing. The flip side of that is that it didn't really become um, incredibly, it wasn't like it was became monkish. That The sort of idea was maybe monkish or is pure it was not ostentatious it was minimal but what actually happens is it seems like men or tailors or the people who are making these clothes will go to any length to still distinguish themselves from others so then it mm -hmm. all the opulence became invisible it became look mm -hmm. at if anyone looks has ever seen the construction of a, a custom suit on Savile row and the amount of fittings it takes for that the amount of floating padding on the inside of that. So yes, it's a very monkish suit. It costs a million dollars and it takes a year to make and yes. there's nothing simple about it, but you can still go out in the world and say, oh, me? It's just, I'm just wearing this simple suit. But of course we find ways to distinguish ourselves, right? Yes, yes. So it's shifting from fashion to tailoring and tailoring was what just the well-dressed gentleman did. He didn't follow fashion. Um, he surrendered himself to his tailor. That's what one person said. But absolutely, the, the amount of construction that was necessary to make that suit fit well, what was considered to be elegant, um, was enormous in as much as, you know, some haute couture gowns. 
I want to, we're running out of time because I want to get to questions, but I do want to ask you one other thing that I was fascinated by. I thought that I knew a lot about what flappers were about because I knew a lot about F. Scott Fitzgerald, Zelda, and the flappers of the 1920s. I assumed that they came from wealthy households, smart colleges, and things like that. I learned in your book that it's one of the few, but it's one of the few, it's a fashion movement that actually comes from the street or from from the bottom up from the working class and that it had equal footing with black women and white women. Yes, yes, and working class women. One of the things about the flapper movement was that this, uh, they were, in one sense, it's the great feminine renunciation. It's women casting off the huge skirts and the heavy layers and all of this and, and adopting a streamlined wardrobe. So something that men did hundreds of years earlier, um, but they made it fashionable and so it actually caught on and um, lots of women did it, and it kind of trickled up the uh, social hierarchy. A lot of the women were looking for clothing that was practical to go work in, but of course they were also asserting their freedom and the you know a new uh, kind of social liberty. So wearing that clothing was a way of saying, um, you know, I can go out at night and have a good time just like a man. Um, you know, I, I don't have to sit home and wait for uh, my suitors to call on me. And so it did have that, you know, kind of wild and carefree Daisy Buchanan aspect to it. But it also had this very, very I, 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 serious, I suppose I'd say, side, which was about um, asserting liberty and, you know, in, in asserting, um, you know, to some extent, equal rights. You could see this is on in, in line with the suffragette movement and, you know, other movements for women's equality. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, having said that or gotten to that, uh, I think it's time for questions. Jennifer, if you are around. Oh, I'm around. Oh, that this is so fascinating. Um, sometimes I hate for it to be the part where I come on because I just want you two to keep talking about <laughs> things for a really long time. So sometimes we do have some audience questions, but sometimes I like to invoke host privilege and ask the first question. Um, and that's about dress codes that start very early on. I, I'm a brand new grandmother to a little uh, granddaughter and she wears mostly green and brown and uh, some yellow and stuff and not a whole lot of pink. Um, and I, I, I know there's a little bit in the book about pink and blue, boys and girls, um, and how that's not always been divided up the way we understand it to be these days. Uh, can you talk at all about that whole thing? Sure, so I, one interesting thing is that um, at in the early 20th century, pink was considered to be a masculine color and blue the feminine color. And so you'll look at some guidebooks saying, you know, of course, pink being a stronger color is suitable for the boy and soft blues, um, you know, complementary to, uh, you know, a feminine uh, look. And then, you know, sometime around the 1950s, it, it, it switched um, and blue became associated with boys and pink with girls. Another thing about the dress of small, very small children and infants was that for a long period of time until again, the mid 20th century, um, boys as well as girls were dressed in very similar clothing, including, um, you know, gowns and hair with curls. You know, if you look at pictures of like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, for instance, as a baby, you know, he's got, you, you think it was a little girl. Um, and the idea was that the masculine and feminine divide didn't happen until later in life. The boy got his first pair of pants, the long pants and his first haircut. And then you had a real division in the way boys and girls dressed. So a lot of this is of relatively recent origin. There's some great pictures out there uh, of Ernest Hemingway as a young baby dressed in, in a dress. The sort of yeah. like er example of 20th century, you know, major masculinity uh, was also dressed as a, as a girl when he was an infant. I, I think that is fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, so Jamie has uh, a couple questions here in our audience, and I'm going to go to uh, Jamie's second one first, which is, is there a time in history where society was less judgmental or restrictive when it came to fashion than at other times? Oh, it was there a time? At, I would say before the 1300s, probably the answer is yes, and particularly with respect to members of non-elites. Um, so there's a, in the ancient world, there were still some sumptuary laws and dress codes, but they were much less um, detailed. 
and they were much more focused on the need to reduce expenditure generally than on the need to di differentiate ac according to social rank. Um, so that may be a period of time in which there was at least less um, le le less detailed and kind of regimented ideas about clothing. Thank you. I would only add that uh, in my upbringing in the 1970s Midwest, I wish that there were uh, I wish that there was more judgment and more restriction because <laughs> anything seemed to go. And uh, pictures of me wearing rust colored leisure suits and you know gigantic <laughs> collars I, I i think i could have used dress codes <laughs> <laughs> well you probably did not show up for the first day of seventh grade wearing as i did an i heart david as in david cassidy t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> so yeah <laughs> it's a powerful signifier right <laughs> yeah i'm still in therapy for that uh terry says you speak of individuality as expressed in clothing and america has such a strong individuality streak how do you see laws written or unwritten affecting societies that historically have a greater collectivist streak rather than an individualist um such as japan yes i mean it's an interesting question i, I in the book could not focus as much as I would like on uh, societies outside of you know, the West, Europe and the United States. Part of it is just you know, the constraints of the research uh, agenda. But um, it's uh, the relationship between the kinds of laws and rules that I discuss in the book that you know, prim primarily originated in Europe and um, uh, c countries in either the Middle East, Africa and Asia is quite it, 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 there, there are a few things I can say. You know, one is there's a period of time in which, because of colo the colonial encounters, um, the countries outside Europe begin to adopt European dress. And um, you know, I know that that was true in Japan at a particular period, but it's also true in many other countries. And so there's a kind of a, an interesting tension between traditional dress and Western dress that is not not in all instances imposed, but it's picked up as a uh, you know as a way of relating to the Western world, which is becoming quite dominant at the time. Um, now I know that doesn't quite address the part about um, the relationship between collectivism and individualism, which is you know yet another. Um, yeah, I, but but I'm gonna I, I, I'm gonna stop there because I. Uh, I would only add that in my experience, just observationally and a little bit through my job, what I've seen in uh, more unitary or collective societies, uh, the smaller, kind of like in Western societies earlier on, uh, when people dress more the same way, it's the smallest aberration from that dress, which it, that the sort of significance of that is multiplied to a nuclear effect. You know, it's like if, if you're only wearing a white sheath or a gray sheath and you add a small button or you change a hem or you add a small detail to it, it becomes an act of something that's outrageous or it's provocative. Whereas mm -hmm. you'd have to do an awful lot to be seen as a provocateur in Western fashion for the most part. <laughs> uh, Linda writes, um, in the current day, how does knockoff designer clothing affect the sumptuary law or that, that the whole concept? I think that's a really good question. Oh. In, in the contemporary moment. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, one thing I do mention in the book is the way we could consider uh, trademark law in particular to be a modern form of sumptuary law. That there's a sense in which what's happening with the restriction of trademarks is that it's a guarantee that a particular symbol um, corresponds to a particular amount of expenditure, you know, and, you know, now I don't want to suggest that's all there is to uh, trademarks and branding, but that's one element. Um, and, you know, of course, the controversy in law around fashion involves the fact that designs can't be copyrighted. Um, you could have a trademark, which is a legal protection or a legal monopoly, um, so that someone else can't use that logo on their clothing, but you can't copyright the design. And so these knockoffs, then can you know it's well known they can go and copy them and they do like right the moment the thing hits the um, the, the the first debut on the runway there's someone trying to copy it um, and so that's one set of relations where you know between 
knockoff fashions in what we might describe as a modern form of sumptuary law, that the trademark has now taken on that status because you can't do it through the design. Or can you? I, I would add that there's one very contemporary twist to that, which is the notion of the, the circular economy and uh, companies like the real real, your ah, yeah. as well, yeah. that allow you to essentially rent uh, designer clothing or to buy them used because then you're still wearing the actual trademark, but maybe they've been worn once or twice. There's different levels of it. Obviously, you can find, try to find a, a Gucci gown at a high end at a thrift store. Maybe it have, has a lot of miles on it. You could get one from the real real or something, pay a fraction of the actual cost. Mm. And then there you are uh, violating a sumptuary law. But uh, <laughs> in the right. world of where we want to be sustainable and we want to reuse our clothes, places like that went in our world of Vogue or the fashion world from kind of something we didn't want to acknowledge maybe because we want people to support the fashion industry now that that's an environmental thing and it's a sustainable thing, we're actually in, we're encouraging that. I mean, everything sort of comes around. That's great, right? And then the other side of this is you know, places like Target, which is where I buy all of my clothes. I'm not ashamed to admit. Um, you know, they uh, license with well-regarded designers to create lines of, of fashion uh, of a sorts. Um, uh, for the at affordable prices um so that seems to me like to be a whole different aspect of, of this same argument or same discussion yeah yeah there's a so, couple sides to it yeah you know on the, on the bright side places like target old navy gap um they've come a long way in terms of doing better fashion i mean they make things that people really want to wear it, it doesn't have a i don't know it, it's it's not it, there's no stigma attached to it, uh, especially I think we've our world prizes economy or thrift in a way that maybe it didn't in the 1980s, certainly when mm -hmm. you wanted everyone wanted to think they're on dynasty or something. <laughs> um, the other side of that is that places like um, like, well, you know, there's there's fast fashion out there that make a lot of clothes. They make them at a very cheap price and they destroy a lot of those clothes and a lot of those unsold clothes go into landfills and create uh just a huge mess in terms of environmental issues oh, wow. uh, i'm not singling out target uh or you know any particular company because they all know this at this point and they're all trying to address the sustainable nature of what they do but uh there's a flip side to it I didn't as there is with that. everything of course Vivian wants to know, how might we change the legal slash judicial perception of clothing as an important aspect of personal expression? Who does it go to from a vanity for, uh, excuse me, I don't understand the rest of her question, but um, can we talk about that? Um, sure. Well, um, I'm hoping that writing about it in the way that I have might make some small contribution in that direction. And I do think that there are Here's an example of a new legal um, reform movement that begins to do that. There's something called the Crown Act, uh, which is a, a movement to have um, to, to, to outlaw dress codes that would forbid hairstyles typically worn by African-American women. Uh, now, it's um, and it's, it's interesting that you know, on the one hand, we could think of those dress codes as classic race discrimination. But it's not a really great fit with the existing law around race discrimination. So when plaintiffs would bring these cases, um, you know, the, they would usually lose. Um, it didn't quite fit the law. So the Crown Act is there in order to move the law in a new direction. And I think it's taking off. You know, it's been enacted in several states. New York City has a version of it. Uh, and that's a recognition that the expressive nature matters. Um, you know, yes, you could change your hairstyle, but you shouldn't have to. And it's a recognition mm. that, you know, asking you to have to is an insult in some way, you know, a deep personal insult, but also possibly an insult that has um, racial overtones. And, the, you know, the, the, the success of this movement makes me optimistic that people are beginning to see some of the more profound stakes involved in dress codes. And that leads, uh, Jamie has another question, which is, is kind of a, a dovetails with that a little bit. Concerns over cultural appropriation are often shared in conversations about fashion. 
What are your thoughts on that in terms of freedom of uh, freedom of expression, but also being respectful to cultures, history, peoples, etc.? Yes, I, I've got a, a section about that in the book. It's it, it's a difficult issue because on the one hand, it's certainly true that there are forms of appropriation that are contemptuous or insulting or insensitive uh, to traditional cultures and that those um, deserve to be attacked. And at the same time, uh, sometimes what's called cultural appropriation is really the kind of borrowing that I see as the kind of the lifeblood of fashion and what has been the lifeblood of fashion for hundreds of years which is the use of a symbol in a new context. Uh, because one of the ways that clothing seems to be able to be expressive is to refer to something else in a different historical period or a different social context and bring it into the contemporary context. And you can see that, you know, for instance, when women wore aspects of masculine clothing, um, you could say they were appropriating masculine clothing and people certainly did and condemned them for it. But it was also a way of, uh, you know, doing something new and and expressing a new idea. I'm a liberated woman. You know, I'm a woman who, to some extent, is going to assert masculine privilege. Lots of examples like this. Um, you, a, a person from one social sta class status adopting clothing from a different social class, and it, it went in both directions. It could be the elite adopting working class styles, or it could be the common people adopting the styles of the aristocracy. Um, did so to great effect, to great um, expressive effect, but also in a way that was arguably subversive. And I mean that in the best sense of the word, subversive of old cemented ideas, subversive of illegitimate hierarchies. And so I wouldn't want to condemn all aspects of appropriation in that sense, um, both for, both because of the, uh, both because of their expressive potential, but also because of their you know, social potential. So it's a bit of a balance that requires some nuance, I think. It's a fascinating part of your book, Richard. And uh, I would just point out that there are obvious examples of appropriation. If uh, you know someone wants to adopt the dress of a Native American chief and they want to wear that for a Halloween costume they're, they're, and put it on their kid or something. Maybe people did that 50 years ago. I don't think people can do that now. That's mm -hmm. one example that might seem more obvious, more extreme. You also point out in the book, fascinatingly so, the tuxedo is an example of cultural yeah. appropriation. The tuxedo begins with uh, most of it from England. It's named after Tuxedo Park, New York, a town in New York. And the cummerbund itself is something that was taken from Southeast Asia and adopted into Indian cultures, which British officers during colonial India then adopted. So the tuxedo, which is in some ways the most kind of white bread, country club, sort of strict, pure uniform, is it's 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 a mutt. It's a it, it's an amalgam of of cultures and countries. And I think that's just one example. Uh, you point out the NBA player Jeremy Lin was taking heat from some other players for wearing dreadlocks. Right. Um, Jeremy Lin his repost to that was to ask these other players why they're wearing Chinese character tattoos on their arms. Right. It just, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to navigate. I think you do so very skillfully. You point this out very skillfully in the book. And it's a certain point, like, where do you draw the line? What is a tribute to a culture? What is borrowing from a culture? And what is appropriating that culture in a way that's uncool and yeah, there's no simple answer to it, as you point out. And, and who gets to decide the answers right. to those well, questions? Yeah, right. Oh, wow. That was fascinating. And thank you for that little primer on, on the tuxedo. Thank you. Yes. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, oh, uh, Linda wants to, uh, says, uh, I find the trend of men and boys wearing pants hanging well below the bottom so offensive. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on this trend? Oh, the sagging pants. I've got a little bit in the book about the sagging pants. I have to admit, I don't understand it fully. I mean, I don't know why I, I'm not, don't know why people like to do it. Um, but it's certainly, you know, it's one of these things that's taken so much heat and that, um, you know, it, it, it's got, of course, racial and class overtones, the reaction to sagging pants. 
Um, there have been laws passed against it, local ordinances um, that you know fine people for wearing sagging pants. Really? One person was actually sentenced to jail um, for contempt of court for wearing a pair of sagging pants. So um, you know, it, it's it's a it's a real lightning rod, and it expresses so much about the attitude of. You know, I think a certain segment of uh, um, young African American men and an attitude of kind of defiance of a particular kind that, um, and I think it's that message of, kind of social defiance that's really rubbing people the wrong way with the sagging pants, even more so than um, you know, anything aesthetically about them. Although, you know, I, I understand why people find them aesthetically kind of odd. And, you know, we could talk a whole nother hour about the issues of comfort versus fashion. Um, and to me, the sagging pants just look really uncomfortable. I can't imagine walking around like that all day. Um, and uh, there, I'm sure that has implications in all kinds of other um, uh, questions about dress codes and, and fashion. Yeah. Um, There's a way in which sagging pants almost remind me of the modern day iteration of the zoot suit. The zoot suit back in the 1940s, you know, big, baggy, flamboyant, you know, really, and it, and it, it, it expressed a, a stance of a certain type of defiance, uh, which people understood at the time and really didn't like. And there was a sense in which, as compared to most of what other people wore, it looked really strange. The proportions were distorted and odd. Um, so you, you could see a line from the zoot suit to sagging, I think. Wow. And this part, something that Richard covers very well in the book, is that there's a there's a subculture of defiance in dress. The, the the sagging pants is one direction of it. The other direction of that are dandies and are people like British mods and things like that who yeah. wanted to kind of give two fingers to society, but they did it by dressing up rather than down and by essentially proving themselves in some way faultless because you, you can't say I can't come to into this club because I'm dressed better than anybody else here. Yeah. And it's a bit of an attention seeking thing, but it's also a kind of defiance because they're just doing what they want to do. And some for some people, you also get into the notion of nudism. Um, mm -hmm. Is nudism the ultimate freedom from fashion? Maybe it's not. I don't know. Like, I think it's often a fashion statement. And um, what I mean by that is that it's it's not innocent. If someone, you, there, there's a guy in Berkeley who used to walk around naked all the time. They called him the naked guy. Um, and, you know, he'd just walk into coffee shops or whatever. Uh, and, um, you know, he was making a statement. He doesn't, just didn't feel like we were in clothes that day. Um, and in many ways, it perhaps is one of the more powerful fashion statements that are left in a society in which, as you say, Corey, you know, it's really hard to do something that is seen as um, you know, really outside the bounds. Um, that still is. Wow. Well, for better or for worse, I, I live in New England, so uh, nudism is <laughs> not an option. Not an option. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I just want to, first of all, thank our audience for their wonderful questions. You know, Mark Twain House uh, audiences are renowned for their good questions. We hear it all the time from our speakers. So thank you um, for, uh, for those good questions. We're running out of time now. And I just want to end by asking, what are you both working on next? What's coming up? Ah, uh -huh. well, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of blogging for a, a, a medium um that site and so i'm writing a bunch of stuff for them i just found out about something fascinating which are um it's the next iteration of fast fashion and what it is is um virtual clothing like if you have a, a kid who plays Fortnite in their skins um now what's happened now is that you can get a, a non-fungible uh, am i doing that right non-fungible token and um that is attached to the virtual clothing and then you can put it on your instagram page you, or you can wear it in a video game or a virtual space. And apparently this is really taking off. And there are even some designers who are designing virtual clothing. So I want to start to look into this. Oh, wow. Who knew? That is fascinating. <laughs> we will watch that space. And, and Corey, how about you? Anything new on your horizon? I'm continuing to uh, help put out Vogue magazine and Vogue.com. And in my spare time, I am 
kind of creative directing a global ad campaign for a new motorcycle from Harley Davidson. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's very strange. It's just I ride know. motorcycles too, so it's not just fashion uh, all the time. Who uh, knew? Who oh, that, knew? So has either of you been to the Mark Twain house? I have no, not. No, I'm dying to go. Well, we. so one of the things I like to say is that the, uh, the Mark Twain house is a writer's home and a home for writers. And you both are now part of our circle of writers. And we are going to count on having you come see us in person um, one of these days when it's safe to do so. In the meantime, everybody, I cannot believe, if you haven't already made the decision to purchase this book, um, <laughs> click the link at the very top of the chat. And uh, remember, you get a signed copy and uh, it benefits us and uh, come to our gala and thank you both so much what a fascinating evening i, I just I really enjoyed every minute and i know our audience has too thank you i've had a wonderful time thanks so much Corey, for talking to me thank you sir thanks for writing the book <laughs> thanks Jennifer, for having us oh it's yeah, my pleasure you. absolutely it's great to have both of you have a great rest of your evening um and we'll see you again soon i hope thanks Bye -bye. sounds good, good.